Herbal. Thank you so much for being here with me today. It's, Thank you for having me, Jen. It's a real honor to discuss. And to me. And to meet with you. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple questions about your career and your life. Okay. And to begin with, uh, can you tell me about how you got into psychology? I know it wasn't the beginning of your career. It wasn't what oh, you meant to do. how I got into psychology. Yes. There are actually two answers to that. One is I got into psychology, and the other is I got into couples therapy. And they are obviously a continuum. Um, my couples therapy was much, much later. Um, how I got into psychology was uh, in graduate school. Um, I was had earned a theological degree. And a, a friend of mine who was a professor uh, in uh, Lexington, Kentucky, at uh, at a theological seminary there. He was at Union Seminary where I was uh, getting my uh, master's in theology. He was a professor on sabbatical, but he was a Baptist, and I'm a Baptist, and we were the only two Baptists at Union Theological Seminary at that that year. And I'd come back from internship and was ready to do my last year. And so, you know, I, I looked him up. He sort of looked me up. He discovered there was a Southern Baptist at Union. Uh, I discovered there was a Southern Baptist professor at Union. And Union is too liberal a school for Baptists to be there. But we were clearly not typical Baptists. And we got together. And he said, uh, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I said, well, I'm going to graduate school. What are you going to study? I said, I'm going to do theology and culture. Going to go to, I applied to two or three places, got into one already. He said, ah, it's not a good idea. We just met. You were telling me it's not a good idea. He said, no. Nah. He says, you're, you're so cerebral and so academic. You, just, you, need, you need an experience with life. I grew up poor. I know what life is all about. I worked, I worked my way to this point. And he said, that's the point. Because you only used your mind. You've never used your heart. And I can tell. He said, so I have an idea. I want you to come to the seminary with me next year as my teaching assistant. And I have two books I'm working on. So you can teach the courses when I'm not there and help edit my books. Well, he was in pastoral care and counseling. Mm. Well, I know nothing about pastoral care and counseling. He said, we don't have to. You just have to, you're a good writer and just have to, you know, help me edit them. But he said, while you're there, um, that, that I have a requirement and that is that you have to do an internship in a mental hospital. That was the, uh, with the schizophrenic was. I said, you got to be kidding. I don't want to, I don't, I don't care anything about psychology and the mental health professions. He said, you need to go to a mental hospital as a chaplain. So I don't know why, but I trusted this guy. I went to, from New York to Louisville. Um, my wife trusted me at the time, as Jane, my first wife. I went to that mental hospital. I spent uh, four and a half months as a chaplain there, and then four and a half months in a regular uh, hospital where just physical illnesses. And when I, while I was there, going through that bath of psychology and taking some courses with him, reading his books and beginning to, uh, how I, academically I was, uh, uh, because my, my um, background had been, so, so I'm interested in psychology as an academic discipline, you know, the meta theory and stuff like that, but not as a practice. Um, a guy came down from the University of Chicago to lecture there, who was the head of the Department of Theology and Psychology at the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. And so I met him and um, told him what I was doing. And he said, so you'll be done here in a year? And I said, yeah, I'll be you know, three more months. Um, and he said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. This has been a kind of a derailing and a detour and um, probably going back to theology and culture because i got to apply. 
and he said, look, I have an idea. You come to the University of Chicago and enter the program there in theology and psychology. I'll be your mentor. Wow. <clears throat> and you get a degree in which you can blend your theological and psychological interests. So I went to Chicago. These doors kept opening. <laughs> and I then began to study at the theoretical level, the interface between theological assumptions and psychological assumptions. But I'd had this background in those mental hospitals where raw human nature, it was so clear what it was like at a graduate school. So aseptic and clean and you know everybody's okay there. And then the general hospital, I, I mean, I, I told somebody, this is the first time in the past three weeks, first time I've ever been sick in my life. So I don't even know what general hospitals are like. Something kept gnawing at me about that. So I began to move toward a clinical internship at the University of Chicago Hospitals and Clinics as a chaplain. And so I started working with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, wow. who created the death and dying yeah. stuff. I knew her before she coined that phrase wow. and was a part of the research of the chaplains who were finding the patients and interviewing them that she was researching for the death and dying book. I had no idea anything important was going on <laughs> at the time. And while working there, a guy who was running a pastoral counseling center downtown said he needed a part-time uh, student to come down and see some clients at his center. And could I work 14 hours a week? He'd pay me $50 an hour. $50 an hour? Um, sure. Um, I said, I've never seen a client. He said, well, he was a psychologist, and he had his own background. And he also had a theological background. So we were, you know, kind of in the same thing. So he said, I'll supervise you. So he gave me a client. I don't know what in the hell to do with this client, but I went in and uh, started working. And then uh, every, time, after, every time I'd see somebody, I'd have an hour with him and see somebody and, or, or 15 minutes with him. So he supervised me every step of the way. And then he, made, he, then he said, now, now you, need, you need now to do some personal work. What does that mean? He said, you need, you need to go into therapy. I said, why would I go to therapy? He said, well, it's because you'll become a better clinician, you know, if you have your own self-understanding. So I went into psychoanalysis and went to the Chicago Analytic School. Uh, and because it's a training institute, I got one of the top analysts to super, to, um, no, no. I, I saw one of the top analysts for $8 an hour, I think, and one of their top people became a parallel supervisor to my work at the center. I couldn't set any of this up or afford any of it. So I was there about two years in analysis with an analyst supervising my work and a psychologist supervising my work. And so I shifted slowly into the field of pastoral care and counseling and eventually teaching marriage and family therapy, wow. uh, which is what I was teaching when I got my divorce in 1975. <laughs> and that was the on-ramp into becoming interested in marriage. Mm. I said, uh, you know, I, I came back from the divorce court, 9 o'clock one morning, got my divorce, 1030 seminar, 12 graduate students, marriage and family therapy. And it's like, and they're all Methodist ministers who are all clergy. And I thought, this is going to be the most horrible day of my life. <laughs> and so I went in, I, I waited 20 minutes hoping they'd leave because, you know, because you can, if the professor doesn't show up at Perkins after 20 minutes, the students have an excused absence. So I said, I'll give them an excused absence. They waited. Mm. And they said, um, we know where you've come from, Dr. Hendricks. And you have our prayers. Mm. I, we don't want to talk about it. And there are 12 of us, and we've been talking while waiting for you, because I was late. And what we discovered is that four of us are already divorced. We're only 22 years old. Four of us have marriages that are very difficult. Four of us have never had a sustainable relationship. So what we want to talk about is, why do men and women have such difficulty being together? Let's just cut the crap, get out of the course and all the theory. Why do men and women, why can't they make it? I said, 
I don't have the foggiest idea. <laughs> I know all the literature, but my life as a divorced person clearly refutes my knowing anything. So uh, this goes into the uh, marriage stuff. So after two hours, uh, which was a heated conversation in which nobody knew anything, uh, I realized this was an important conversation. I mean, who says, why do couples fight? You know, that's just a phrase, right? It's cute. Why do couples fight? Well, they're stupid, or they're immature, or they don't know how to talk, or, you know, all kinds of superficial answers. But somehow I, I had a feeling from that conversation that why couples fight was profoundly important and not just a kind of skill, new skill development. So I told this class, I said, I want to make a commitment to you. Um, I'm going to find the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. rest of my life, I'm going to study couples. And I get the answer. I'll let you know. Well, the university helped me with that by firing me. Oh, man. So that I was in <clears throat> had a three-year terminal contract after that. In that three years, I made a transition into private practice, studying couples, and studied them for eight years. Wrote everything down. Read, I'd read everything, wrote everything down, and tried to listen without any of my preceding, you can't do it, but at least I tried to drop all my assumptions. And in 1988, I published Getting the, Helen and I, and Helen and I worked together during all this time. We met um, uh, two years after my divorce and a year after hers. So we became partners and co-creators in this conversation that led to magotherapy wow. on our first date. Uh, well, we had a fight. And on your first date? On our first date. You've got to then, tell that then, story. Then we had to talk about, well, how come we can't get through a date without a fight? I mean, <laughs> well, you're divorced, I'm divorced. There's something going on here. Put all this together into getting the love you want in 1988. And then I wrote back to my students in that class and said, here's my first response to the question, why do couples fight? Happens to be a book. What's really wonderful about your answer is that there wasn't a straight trajectory. And I think no. a lot of people have paths that weave and wind. Yeah. And so it's really inspiring to hear someone of your stature and success being able to share the story of not having gotten there directly, yeah. of having taken many paths. Not even planning to go there. <laughs>